Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth. I'm your host, Amy Walker, and joining me this week to delve into a story from history is my guest, Chris Haig. Hi. Hi, how are you doing, Chris? I am good. I am ex- you know, excited to see what kind of weird or wonderful concoction you've got cooked up for me, particularly because last time I was on it was a bit of a darker subject and I was like... Yeah, but it'd be nice to get put to someone not quite. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to get worried since then because you hadn't come back on. It's like, oh, have I, have I traumatized yeah, him like, too much? Like, <laughs> like you, you broke me. I was just like, what happened? I'm like, I went on Amy Walker's show. Uh, no, it was. I think it was kind of a slacking thing where I was like, oh, okay, and it weirdly worked out with my uni stuff as well. So I was like, cool, I'll do this. And the past kind of two... Actually, I don't know, it's been about four weeks. I don't think I've been on since, like, e- uh, before Easter time, actually. So it's been a few weeks. Um, so it was, like, work and uni stuff, and I just thought, you know, it'd be nice to have a break and everything, but I still... I, I love the show, and I uh, follow the Instagram, so I was just like, I never knew that happened on this day. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to try and find those sort of side of things that you don't normally hear about, and some of the really early stuff as well, like ancient pre-AD sort of China and Rome and stuff like that. It's like, oh, that's, I didn't realise they'd actually have a date really pinned down for those events. It's it's kind of interesting. Yeah, exactly. You would think, oh, OK. It's because a lot of them don't use, like, Gregorian calendar. So how far have people had to work back? Or is it, like, an arbitrary date? Or is it, like, a... So, yeah, that's why, you know, it's, it's, it's a fairly good Instagram to follow, to be fair. So if you're not following it... At least find out when some, you know, Mayan festival or kind of when a Chinese emperor was murdered, sort of thing. But it's it's worth a it's worth a follow. Thank you. And there you go. There's the promotion, guys. Go <laughs> go go. Follow us. I was like, you don't need something to the rest of it. It's just it's promo. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully you'll enjoy this episode as well. It. It, honestly, it's not going to be as bad as the last time you were on. I'm not going to give you two of those in a row, so this is I'm a lot say, of fun. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, last time you did give me like a full like week's head up going in, like, oh yeah, just to let you know, it's on something quite dark, and I was like, oh, okay, cool, and like prepped and everything. Um, and I deal with horror and stuff and everything, but I was like, oh wow, this is, even by my, my standards, I was like, oh, this is, yeah, quite dark and everything, but now I'm looking forward to something a bit. Uh, a bit lighter, a bit more fun. So, yeah. Well, hopefully you'll have a good laugh at this. I laughed a few times doing the research, just sitting there at my computer. So, fingers crossed, you'll find it fun. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and hopefully you won't have heard of this person as well. I've had <laughs> I've had a few episodes where someone goes, oh yeah, I know that person. Oh, great. You're sure? <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so let's get into our story. Robin Friday was born in Acton, West London, on the 27th of July, 1952, along with his twin brother, Tony. Their parents, Alf Friday, a driver for a laundry firm, and his wife, Sheila, were both born in Acton and had married a year before at the age of 20, having met just three years prior. Sheila's father, Frederick Riding, had played professional football for Brentford before the Second World War. The Fridays lived with Sheila's family until moving to a prefab home of their own in Acton Green, when Robin and Tony were aged two. They moved to a masonette in South Acton in 1962, when it was found that their prefab was sinking. Robin and Tony were later described by their mother as having been remarkably close, rarely arguing or fighting. A notable difference in personalities was that Robin was shy, whereas Tony was more confident. 
the twins attended their first professional football match at the age of two, when their father took them to Brentford match at Griffin Park. From the age of four, Alf took both boys to play football at the local park every single afternoon. Oh, that's when I haven't heard of this person. It's football. It is football related. <laughs> oh, it's like, it just it was reminding me because um, I was a, it, this is just like an aside, but I was in the office this today um, and doing some work that sort of thing, and I heard two kind uh, of well, actually no three. Um, it was two guys and the girl were talking about football and everything in my office, and I just I felt myself draining away. I'm like, no, I'm not dealing with this. And they're like, Chris, what do you think? And I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I've never been raised with it. Um, well, but yeah. if, it's, okay. if it's any encouragement, I have no interest in football at all. I couldn't give two tosses about the sport, but this person... <laughs> This person <gasps> astonishes me, and I think I kind of love them. Oh, okay. I'm in now. I'm in. <laughs> Around the age of 10, Robin possessed notable ball skills, and according to his father, could flick an orange up onto his neck, balance it, and then let it roll back down his body and catch it on his foot. <laughs> Sorry, I'm taking a drink, man. <laughs> <laughs> I just, the minute you said that he managed to catch an orange in his neck, I just... Yeah, okay, all right, fair, 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 fair skill. I was just taking my surprise then, all right. As well as football, Robin played cricket to a high standard, boxed and played tennis. Despite their many similarities and common interest in sports and football in particular, the twins were wildly different in academic terms. Whilst Tony did well at school, Robin was uninterested and, according to his brother, was always bunking off, having birds around the park. <laughs> oh, that's such a 60s thing. Just the whole... Oh, I, what, bunking I got, off and having like, birds? Well, the bun- you know, bunking off thing. All right, I get it. It's more the phrase. It's like, oh, they're bunking off, having birds around the park. What <laughs> the hell? <laughs> I j- okay. All right, okay. I, used to, I Genuinely, the last time I heard a guy refer to someone as... You know, a bird. It was in an Uber camera like two years ago. It went, it went, oh, my old, my old bird. And I was like, yeah, it's definitely wow. a phrase that has died off. <laughs> yeah, and th- thankfully for it, but I'm not female, I don't know how I feel or anything, but I don't think women really appreciate it being likened to, like, you know, kind of ospreys and kind of chickens <laughs> and stuff. I don't think anyone's been like, do you know what he did? He called me a pigeon and it was. It was so nice. I'm just like, okay, fair enough. The flip side to that, though, if someone referred to you as being like a hawk, that would be kind of cool. Yeah, but I d- yeah, but yeah, but that's the specific thing. If it just call you a bird, it's just like that's too general. <laughs> like, I mean, I mean, it only works with certain things, and it's certain like characteristics as well. I know this is not the point of this episode, but we're going there. <laughs> it's like you know, ah. Oh, like a hawk, like a falcon, like an eagle, and they're all quite aggressive. No one's ever been like, do you know what? He he was sweet like a cockatoo. <laughs> like pretty as a parrot. Like that sort of thing. It's always like, oh yeah, it's this, it's this fucking orchestral. And I was just like, what? What is this weird? So yeah, I, yeah. Quite a weird one, but I just, it's one of, you know, the, have you ever got those phrases where it's like the minute you hear it, you sort of just kind of, you kind of you cringe on the inside and sometimes the outside. Birds is mine is is one of mine, and sometimes my brother will use it just to annoy me. Like he says, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna go going around, you know, look at look at some birds," and I'm like, "That sounds technically innocent, but I know you're doing it creepy just to annoy me." And he says, "Yeah, I know." I'll <sighs> have to see if I can drop the phrase in there a lot more now just to get to you. <laughs> no. If you do, I'll stop it. I'll do it. I'll walk out mid show. I'll be there like, this is a very short episode of <laughs> the Because I use, use the phrase, walking around the park with some birds. Um, and Chris Hague just left. <laughs> so. Apparently, mm. saying bird 57 times was his limit. <laughs> <laughs> just going, bird, birds, 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 birds. And I'm like, this is how people develop phobias. Isn't it? This is how this happens. <laughs> it just repeated like, you know, an emphasis of a word. Oh my god, we were on a point somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Sorry, yeah, okay, bro. so he's not good at school. Yes, yes, he, he likes socialising with young ladies. Robin was scouted by numerous London sides during his teenage years, joining Crystal Palace's School of Excellence at around the age of 13, then moving on to Queen's Park Rangers, and then to Chelsea, with whom he attended the 1967 FA Cup final. As one of the club's youth players, he was part of the team's official party. However, Friday's individual style of play and refusal to change his game resulted in each of these clubs losing patience with him. The twin brothers joined a men's team, the Acton British Legion Reserves, at the age of 14, and in some matches would play alongside their father. Tony played in midfield and Robin up front, but according to Tony, his brother was better as a goalkeeper than a forward. He was a brilliant goalkeeper, he had no fear, but he obviously preferred banging them in the other end. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that is okay. the quote. I didn't change that for you. No, that is the quote. No, I believe you. I believe you. <laughs> I just, I can't, I just, no, okay. Run it in, Chris, run it in. At around this time, Robin became interested in music, dancing, and attending concerts. He also had a talent for drawing, but suddenly abandoned this interest at the age of 15. Robin became more outgoing than his brother and started taking drugs in his mid-teens. He left school at 15, a year before Tony, and began training as a plasterer. He lasted two months as a plasterer before moving on to become a first a van driver for a grocery firm, then a window cleaner. His laid-back attitude and indifference was already clear. In his father's words, he didn't care. Friday regularly stole by this time, and despite numerous convictions, did not go to a detention centre until he was 16. Having been caught stealing what Tony recalled to be a car radio, he was released almost immediately because he suffered from asthma. Is that a thing? <laughs> It was in the 60s. <laughs> so you're like, oh no. I, I've been nicking lots of stuff, but you cut me out because I have a lung... I, I have asthma, don't get me wrong, I'm not being like, oh, asthma, it's not a thing. I'm well aware it's a thing. But I, in no way have they ever said, believe well, asthma, you might want to, you know, you, you, it's also going to be really useful if you ever get caught doing GBH. <laughs> you know, on nicking a load of stuff, you're being like, listen, if you just say you've got asthma, and you have you'll be fine. Like, I think that's quite funny, to be honest. The idea that they're just like, well, he, you know, he's a hard and, he's a hard and criminal. We have, to, we have to let him out because he needs an inhaler. There you go. If anyone's listening to this and is in trouble with the law, check yes. with your lawyer in case that is still a valid defence. Yeah. Listen, hey, listen, if, if nothing else comes out of, <laughs> nothing else comes out of this episode, just be like, listen, kids, stealing is wrong, but use... <laughs> Using, using, using your ass as a whisk out of it. That's just smart. Da, da, da. Oh my god. Okay. I, I sort of like this guy. I mean, I dare say if I'd met him, I would have hated him, but I kind of <laughs> love him at the moment. That's genius. Oh, this is just the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> okay, alright. Ugh. <sighs> Unfortunately, after he reoffended three months later, he was sent to Felton Borstal, where he served 14 months. During his time there, Friday became stronger and fitter, and also starred for the Borstal football team. He was selected for the Prisons League All-Star men's team, still aged 16, and allowed out of Borstal to train and play with Reading's youth team, for which he appeared three times in the South East Counties League during the 1968 and 69 season. After his release, Friday returned to Acton, where he had a girlfriend called Maxine and a baby daughter named Nicola. Maxine was of mixed race. The local controversy surrounding the interracial relationship caused the couple and their circle of friends to be socially isolated. It also led to physical attacks on the group one night at an Acton public house. Oh no. Yep. This is still the 60s, unfortunately. I know. Okay. Despite this, and the opposition by both sets of parents, they married at the age of 17. So he's still only 17 at this point. Wow. 
Uh, that is a lot that's happened. Before I know. <laughs> okay, alright, alright. I'm, I'm accepting this. I'm just like, okay, so this is 16. He's got many more years to go ahead. I'm like, okay, let's just see what happens. Friday did not take his marital commitment seriously and continued to womanize, drink heavily, and take narcotics. <sighs> A friend who played for Walthamstow Avenue, a semi-professional league club from North East London, took Friday along to training one day in early 1971. He played well enough for them to sign him on the same day, on wages of £10 per week. Many of his new teammates were asphalters from East London, and he soon joined them in that trade. Friday made his debut for Walthamstow on the 27th of March 1971, against Bromley, coming off the bench to set up an equaliser. His first goal came on the 17th of April, when he played against Tooting and Mitcham, he once again appeared as a substitute and scored a header late in the game. He joined West London club Hayes in December in 71, after scoring twice against them in an Eastman League match. Hayes offered him £30 a week, and were also based closer to his home in Acton. A near-fatal accident at work in July 1972 caused Friday to undergo extensive surgery. While working on a roof in Lambeth, a hoist rope became stuck on the scaffolding he was working on. He managed to attempt to free the rope, but fell and landed on a large spike. Oh! The spike went up through one of his buttocks, mm. through his stomach, and narrowly avoided a lung. Oh, God. Okay. Not only was he strong enough to pull himself off the spike... He recovered from his injuries within three months and returned to playing football in October. I'm sorry, I'm not laughing, but, but, the idea that he just pulled a rope, fell off, and then had a spike go through, go, go through an arse cheek, Yep. and then, like, arse cheek, through various layers of viscera, I'm guessing, into the stomach, and then lung, and then... Near fatal, but apparently he was fine enough to pull himself off it. Like, he was there just like, hang on, hang on. Like, getting a splinter out. Just like, hang on, lads, hang on. Oh, God, oh, God. He's not human. He, he <laughs> cannot be hit to his stomach. No. Is it going to turn out that he's, like, there's something needs genetics or something? Where he's just like, no, it's fine, he can survive, survive getting, like, you know, shish kebabbed. Uh, y- you figured it out. This is the origin story of the X Men. <laughs> he is the man who inspired Stan Lee. To be fair, Robin Friday, it's not it's not a bad like superhero <laughs> alter ego, you know. Spike, otherwise known as Robin Friday. <laughs> what what's his superpower? But if you stick a spike in him in anywhere, he's pretty much fine. Oh good. <laughs> Okay. But only spikes. Anything else will kill him. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like <laughs> we're not we're not mad here, Raymond. I mean, we know this. We know it's just like <laughs> it's gotta be a particular like spiky thing, you know. What about like a fork? What about like, you know, like a pitchfork? No, that won't work. It's gotta be a spike. <sighs> right. Do bullets count as very small spikes? <sighs> It, de- it 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 depends. Are they very tall, very rounded spikes? <laughs> Doing like that, you know. Oh what, god, if what? it's going to pierce you, I'd hope it's not a rounded spike. You'd want it sharp because it'd go in easier. Oh, I'm really thinking. Well, it's kind of like the whole thing. It's like, could you stab someone with a butter knife? And I'm like, I think if you put in a force, and you would, because it takes a pound of pressure to break the skin. So, sorry, I'm taking way much too thought into this. But... <laughs> Yeah, I just I just know that because uh, on a fun fact on uh, one of the director's commentaries on Firefly the TV show <laughs> um, mentioned the fact that one of the characters says, "Oh, it takes a pound of pressure to break the skin," and he said, "Oh no, I genuinely have to look that up." But I was like, "I've always remembered that." <laughs> so no, I don't know if you have like a particularly strong butter knife and or a bullet, I guess, or like a round spike. I think it should be fine. Um, I'm glad this guy survived. I'm not quite sure how, given the fact it wasn't just, oh, he got it stuck over his ass. He managed to get it, like, through the stomach, which I imagine the stomach yeah. just broke up the balloon. Because it's just full of acid, so it must have just gone, like, <clears throat> and just, like, into the lungs. What am I thinking? Oh, my 
Ooh, okay. <laughs> Alright. I've accepted it, I'm moving on. Friday was known at Hayes for his excessive drinking, and on one occasion, the team started a match a player short because he had not turned up. When he finally arrived, 80 minutes after kickoff, his intoxication was obvious, but he was still sent onto the pitch with the match still goalless. The opposition paid him little attention, and he managed to score a late winning goal. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Okay, I don't understand football, just to make sure. So for how many, how, how long is a game? 90 minutes. Okay, so he comes on for the last 10 minutes. Yeah. He's so drunk, the team doesn't notice him, and he gets a goal. The winning goal, yes. <laughs> I'm a little bit in love with him, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, he's there just like, just like, the, just, I, uh, <laughs> I'm actually speaking, I can't formulate it, because I'm like, he, he sounds, he, he sounds like, like, why hasn't Tom Hardy played him? That's the only thing I can think of. I'm like, this is literally, like, get Tom Hardy or, like, Jack O'Connell to play him, and I would watch the film just to be like, you know, he's so drunk, he scored a goal. And I'm like, yeah, sounds about right. Okay. To be honest, there should be a film about this guy. Because I know. He, he is amazing. Well, harkening back to my first one, alongside the film for Elizabeth Fry, which I still think should be a thing... You know, Robin, Robin Friday. You know, why, why, why not? It writes itself. It's like <laughs> it's like Dark Forest Gump. You can't believe that it matters <laughs> to one person's life, but it's real. Holy hell! All right. Again, I'm going to reiterate: we're on page two of about ten. <laughs> <laughs> I was not thinking like, oh, it'll all quiet down. You're like, no, nope, this is nothing. Yeah, this this is this is so like we're we're not even past the turf, let alone into the bedrock or anything. There are so many layers in this. Oh good lord. Okay. Hayes were drawn to play football league fourth division club Reading in the FA Cup second round on the ninth of December nineteen seventy two. The team managed to draw nil nil at Reading and earned the right to a replay at home, which they lost one nil three days later. Although Hayes had lost, the interest of Reading manager Charlie Hurley was piqued. Hurley travelled to Hayes more than once to watch Friday. Having researched the player's background, he was cautious about signing him, but was impressed all the same with his on-field performances. The 1972-73 season was Friday's most prolific non-league year in terms of goals. He briefly joined Enfield early in the 73-4 season and scored against Hayes, in an FA Cup tie before returning to London in December 1973. He had also been approached by third division side Watford. Friday signed for Hurley's Reading side in January 74 for £750. He had scored 46 goals in 67 appearances for Hayes over his two spells there, but during his three Isman League sessions he had been sent off seven times. Friday signed as an amateur, meaning that although he would be contracted to Reading, he would be able to continue appearing for Hayes and working as an asphalter in London. He would train part-time with Reading and play for their reserve team. One quote about his first training session said, They were playing a -a six-a-side game, and Robin went around trying to kick as many of the established Reading players as he could. He must have put two or three out of the game, and Hurley had to call him off. Why? <laughs> because he's mad. <laughs> oh my god! Is that just like? Do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna kick on. My, I'm gonna kick my new colleagues. <laughs> no one does that in a job. No one's there on day one being like, do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna fucking hovel Karen from accounts. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see how she goes, and then I'm gonna get Dave from finance. I'm gonna go around kicking him just to, just to let him know I've arrived. Oh my god. Okay, you right. got to establish yourself on day one. Yeah, as like the you know like oh hi, I'm so and so. This is my new no 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 not hi. Over the course of the day, I'm probably <laughs> gonna kick at least three or four of you <laughs> just to assert my dominance as for no fucking reason. Oh my god. Okay. <sighs> In Hurley's words, Friday trained like he played. He had no other way of playing. 
his new manager had to take him out of training on numerous occasions because of the injuries he would refl- inflict on his own teammates in an effort to win. <laughs> oh, yeah, great. How are we going to win? You fucking <laughs> got everyone. <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, I won, though. You're like, no, you didn't. By taking out the entire team because you were too busy beating the shit out of everyone. I'm trying to, like, kick... No one wins. Oh, my God. Okay. <laughs> Well, oh. I like his tactics. If the other team all have to go off with injuries, you win. Default, surely. Well, I... Well, yeah, but it's his own teammates. What's the point of like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is great practice and everything. It's like, yeah, you know, if you get the other team, I can sort of understand it in that sense, but you're doing it to your own teammates. So your own teammates can't play. So you're basically being a one-man band against an entire other team, all because you want that. No, this guy's absolutely off his rocket. Yep. I can't I believe it's not going to be a film made of it. I can't believe it. Yeah. <sighs> By late January 1974, Reading were on a run of 14 games with only two victories. While Friday had performed strongly in three reserve matches... Hurley registered the amateur forward to play in the Football League on the 23rd of January 1974 and gave him his first team debut four days later. Friday turned in a performance against Northampton Town at Elm Park that the Reading Evening Post called Outstanding as Reading drew 3-3. The team then travelled to Barnsley on the 3rd of February, having not won away from home in four months. After Barnsley led 2-0 at half-time, Friday scored his first league goal with a header just after the break to make the score 2-1. Reading immediately offered a professional contract, which Friday signed on the 6th of February 1974. His new salary was only half of what he earned as an asphalter. Friday's technical ability made him very popular among Reading supporters and pressmen alike. The Reading Evening Post reported on Reading's 4-1 victory over Exeter City on the 10th of February 1974. Friday's first matches were professional, describing his performance as sheer magic as he scored twice. The report also called Friday's first goal as the day glorious. He collected the ball wide on the left wing, took it past four extra defenders, and then fired the ball low and hard into the opposite corner from the edge of the penalty area. Friday was conspicuous in the professional ranks for never wearing shin pads and for his resistance to physical harm. No matter how badly he was hurt, he would always get up and continue. X man. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad. We, I'm glad we've established this now. <laughs> I was going to say after like... after the spike story, that statement is just like, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say that's kind of like after the whole horse bodies were like he had a resistance to physical harm. I'm like, yeah, no shit, he had a spike up his ass. <laughs> like that, you know, it's kind of plateaued really. Getting kicked in the shins, he's there like, yeah, this is literally nothing. I recovered from being, like, you know, turned into a kebab and did it and recovered in three months. So, yeah, this is obviously, you know, nothing. Okay. After sustaining a calf injury against Exeter, he returned for the team's next game, away at Lincoln City on the 17th of February. Friday was repeatedly fouled by the opposing players and sustained injuries necessitating five minutes on the sidelines late in the first half. However, he recovered, returned to the game, and set up both Reading goals as his side prevailed by a score of two goals to nil. The team's next game on the 24th of February 1974 was at home against Doncaster Rovers, and with Friday playing a key role, Reading won 5-0. In particular, Friday scored a goal after 17 minutes, described by the Evening Post reporter as magical. With the score 1-0 to Reading, Friday received the ball near the edge of the penalty area at a tight angle and coolly kicked the ball with an outside of his boot low across the goal towards the far post. Although it appeared to be heading yards wide of the goal, the ball suddenly curved at the last moment and clipped the goal post before nestling in the back of the net. The team that has been transformed over Reading Friday has now scored a remarkable 16 goals in five games, reported the Evening Post. And the highlight of this joyous afternoon was a goal by Friday that was worth anyone's admission money on its own. Despite his immediate impact on the pitch and the upturn in Reading's form, 
Friday's off-the-field activities unsettled some of his teammates. Most tolerated his lifestyle because of his importance to the team, but some, particularly defender Tommy Yeldon, were sceptical. He drank extremely heavily, and his antics during the drinking session caused many landlords to lose their patience with him. For example, Friday was barred from Cavishan's Crown Public House after he ended a night there leaping between tables and dancing (laughs) on the bar. (laughs) Oh, we've all done it. (laughs) The Boar's Head in Reading banned him on ten separate occasions. Wow. One night after the pubs closed, Friday and his friend, Rob Lewington, went to an all-night club called Churchill's, where they could continue drinking. When they entered, Friday, wearing a long overcoat and hobnail boots, walked onto the dance floor and removed his coat to reveal that he was wearing nothing underneath. He then began to dance, completely naked except for his boots. Okay. I'm, I'm always laughing at so much. I'm like, okay. Oh, all right. Okay. All right. I'm ready. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm just. <laughs> I don't know what kind of dance you do when you're here. Yeah, I'm just wearing boots. And Hoffman, they're like heavy boots. I know this is the wrong part of the because I'm. But like, the heavy boots as well. So, what the hell can you, you know? It no, would be like, interesting. You can, you, can, you can be like the hottest guy in the world, but still doing like a naked dance in boots, unless you are like a trained Chippendale or something. <laughs> Even then, they don't tend to do it with, you know, everything on show, so dear, dear God. Wow, okay, all right. Oh. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Oh, you're not done. You are not done. (laughs) (laughs) The next paragraph, you're not done. Trust me. (laughs) Oh, no. Although Churchill's, described as the worst club that has ever been in Reading, tolerated such behaviour, the town's fashionable, I'm going to say this right now, Sindelsham Mill nightclub did not, regularly barring Friday for his bizarre activities, including a dance he invented called The Elephant, which consisted of turning the pockets of his jean inside out and undoing his flies to expose himself. That's awful! Yes! (laughs) The El- Oh my god, oh my god. When it's hat. Oh my. (laughs) I just... I'm having to genuinely sense myself now. I'm going to get, oh, otherwise, I will, have to, I will just have to block. Just take away for like, no, I need a break. Okay, all right, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. He and his friends would regularly drink all day, though he was able to exert some self-control. According to his friend, Sid Simmons, Friday would obey Hurley's instructions not to drink for 48 hours before each game. However he would play his prized heavy metal records very loudly at any time of the day or night and take LSD with casual indifference. Hurley attempted to calm Friday down by moving him into an apartment above the football club's elderly ex-groundman. However, this did not work. Even if it were three in the morning, the first thing would be to get his music playing, Simmons later said. We had an old boy living below us, the ex-groundman at Reading. He was coming up to 80, and he had a dog's life in the flat. Pounding music, people knocking on the door, girls throwing stones at windows, the poor old sod. Oh, that's just sad. He's 80, why would you not, you know? If you've got an 80-year-old next neighbour, you go down and have a chat with them, you don't. Thinking, do you know what, it's three in the morning. (laughs) Yes, but you're a rational human being. This is Robin Friday. Do you know, I just feel sad, because that guy's... Well, he will be dead by now with the ex groundsman. If he was 80 back in, in the 70s, 
Ja, ich glaube, sie war halt 110 oder so. Aww. Reading finished the 73-74 season in sixth place, one place higher than the previous year. Friday underwent an operation to have tattoos removed from his fingers during the summer break, and afterwards joined a hippie commune in Cornwall. However, he neglected to inform Reading of this. He was absent without explanation when training started for the 74-5 and season in July, arriving only the day of the closed-door friendly against Watford. Despite his lack of training, he far outperformed the rest of the team. He continued to play well when the league programme began the following month. By September 1974, he was attracting the interest of first division sides Sheffield United and Arsenal. The former had been following him since the game at Barnsley back in February, where he had still been an amateur. Arsenal manager Bertie Mee personally attended Reading's 4-2 home win over Rotherham United on the 12th September, but neither his team nor Sheffield United attempted to sign Friday. After Reading dispatched Newport County 3-0 on the 14th September, Friday and his forward partner, Dick Habin, scored six goals each and topped the Football League goal-scoring chance. However, at the same time, Friday's disciplinary record was becoming so bad that even the Evening Post, who were usually favourable of him, criticised him. He was the Football League's joint top scorer by this time, with nine goals, but he had also already been booked three times that season, and the Post argued that by consistently risking suspension, he was letting the team down. Under the system used then, the three bookings gave him an automatic two-match suspension. The article argued that missing games because of completely unnecessary and stupid infractions amounted to selling the club short. Friday's behaviour on Reading away trips was unpredictable and erratic. In the words of a teammate, John Murray, some of the things he did were funny, but other times they were just mad. (coughs) On the way back from one away match, the team bus pulled over and Friday noticed that they were beside a cemetery. Oh no. Friday jumped over the wall and stole some stone angels from a grave, intending to place them beside the club chairman, Frank Waller, who was asleep on the coach at the time. When he returned, Hurley sternly told him that you must never desecrate a graveyard. Saddened, Friday dutifully returned the statues. Okay, I let the hippie thing slide. <laughs> because I just, I, I kind of thought that was funny to be honest. I thought that it just went, do you know what, I'm just going to join a hippie commune and then come back on the last day and be much better than everyone else. I kind of think that's kind of funny. But the whole desecrated grave, I think, like, he doesn't know, well, maybe he doesn't. I mean, he didn't know anything, but he thought, do you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nick two stone angels from someone's grave. And just, like, just put him on either side of the sleeping, you know, um, was it the coach? Uh, oh, no, um, club chairman, yeah. 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 Um. To be fair, if he hadn't have stolen them from a graveyard, him waking up on the coach and finding two stone angels next to him would be really funny. Yeah, like, if they if, 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 right, if they were, like, from outside a hotel or something. Yeah. And he nicked them and did that. Right, that's fine. It's because it's a graveyard that's making me think, okay, there's something not quite right there. Well, you don't know you, that you don't steal shit from a graveyard. You know? It's a bit. Um, okay. He put them back. He learnt his lesson. Yes. Yes, he did. But he just, it, he, sounds, he sounds like a teenager. Mind you. I mean, what what age is he with this guy? Um, this is 74. He was born 52, so... Oh, so uh, oh he's 22, so he's not old, yeah. old. Oh, fair enough. Okay. I mean, I'm not, like, excusing or anything, but... Okay. On another occasion, Friday reacted to the news that a teammate had smuggled a curl into his hotel room by kicking the door in and catching them mid-sex. Later the same night, he walked into the hotel bar carrying a swan that he had found on the grounds. Ah! Yes, there we go. This is the kind of stuff I like to know. Something they didn't do up to the swamp. Oh, he just found it. Yeah, Where he you found just it. Just find the swamp. <laughs> like, just, they're not like pigeons. There are swans going around all over the shop. I, don't, I just love that idea. Just like, loads of swans. He was just like, I'm going to take this. <laughs> just picks the swan up. I mean, like, what did you do? Found a swan. Where? Dunno. Found it. Oh, my God. Okay. 
All right, I'm kind of back on his side now. <laughs> oh, During an FA Cup tie away against Swindon Town on the 23rd of November, Friday began having trouble breathing, and despite leaving the game for five minutes to recuperate with an inhaler, was eventually forced to come off for good, coughing violently. After recovering from what was reported to be a chest infection, he returned to the team on the 28th of December, having missed four matches, and marked his return with his side's only goal in a 3-1 home defeat to Stockport County. Reading dropped to 12th place on the 6th of January 1975, and were only three points above the re-election places. However, by the time they took on working at home on the 3rd of February, they had risen to 10th. Reading won 3-0 with Friday scoring the third goal with a, spe- with a spectacular header. Diving full length, barely a foot off the ground, Friday risked life and limb to head home a truly memorable goal, wrote the Evening Post-Match Reporter. True to form, he had spoilt things for himself by getting booked three minutes later. This victory marked the beginning of a run of six wins out of seven games, after which the side was once again challenged for promotion to the third tier, hovering between sixth and eighth place for the rest of the season. By 11th of April, promotion looked implorable, but Friday was still overjoyed after scoring a last-minute winner at Reading's 2-1 victory over Rochdale. In celebration, he ran behind the net and kissed a policeman. Okay. The policeman looked so cold and fed up standing there, he explained. I decided to cheer him up for a bit. In the dressing room after the game, he said privately that he wished he hadn't done it because I hate coppers so much. I mean, <laughs> in a way, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just like, well, it's not the fact it was a guy. He's like, listen, it's not the fact, not the fact you're a guy. <laughs> The fact you're a cop, I agree. I'm just like, yay? It's kind of like, oh, I don't think that's homophobic. I don't think. <laughs> he seems like the sort who, I don't think he cares about yeah. men being Which naked it... around men and stuff like that. But yeah. if, if you're a copper, he just doesn't like you because he gets nicked for doing f- crazy things. Yeah. Which is quite nice. Just like, listen, I genuinely know people like this who are like, I don't care if you're gay, if you're whatever, you know. <laughs> but fuck the police. <laughs> I'm like, fierce, okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Reading eventually finished the 74 to 5 season in seventh place, five points behind the promoted teams. Friday was the club's top scorer for the season with 18 goals and 20 overall, and was voted its Player of the Year. Friday's fine form continued in the 75-76 season. After their 4-2 victory over Hartlepool United on the 23rd of September 1975, Reading were top of the 4th Division, having just won four games in a row. Friday, meanwhile, was the club's top scorer. The next game was against Bournemouth on the 27th, and although they won 2-1, Friday was sent off after 79 minutes. By this time, the forward was overwhelmingly popular amongst Reading's fans, to whom he endeared himself by performing a lap of honour after each goal he scored. A month later, after two wins, two defeats and a draw, during October, the team was fourth in the table. Friday was arrested after the evening match away at Newport County on the 20th of October, accused of using obscene language outside a Newport nightclub. At his appearance before magistrates in Newport on the 17th of November, he pleaded not guilty, representing himself, and was acquitted. Oh, that's kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, we're just like, my lord, I shall represent myself. I just said that he secretly, because it seems like he is quite good at a lot of different stuff. Like this weird, you know, like, oh yeah, he was good at, you know, kind of music and dancing and all that sort of thing. It's just like, He's also got a keen legal brain under that. <laughs> I just, I just love that idea that secretly he's like, you know, he should have been on suits or law and order or something. But it's <laughs> like, nah. I just, I just like nick, nicking shit and kicking footballs. So it's like, cool. Okay, all right. Performing strongly for Reading and scoring regularly, he began to attract serious interest from other clubs. Friday is, of course, 
much more than Reading's top scorer and best striker, wrote the Evening Post on the 3rd of November 1975. He is the most vital cog in the team, and last week I understand Reading turned down a £60,000 bid from Cardiff City involving Welsh international Derek Showers. By the new year, Reading were third in the table, on course for promotion and two points behind league leaders Lincoln City. After Reading went four games without a win, starting on the 24th of January 1976, a late goal from Friday ended this run. Twelve minutes from time, he collected a pass from Stuart Henderson and neatly placed the ball past the goalkeeper from the edge of the penalty area. The Evening Post reported, One is increasingly under the impression that if Friday were out for some time through injury, the Reading team would fall to pieces. Led by the free-scoring Friday, the side continued its push for promotion. Fourth or higher would be enough to go up. A vital fixture on the 31st of March 1976 pitted fourth-place Reading at home against Tanmere Rovers, who occupied third spot. Internationally experienced referee Clive Thomas took charge of the game. Friday, who had already scored 18 goals that season, rose to the occasion with an effort that was described by many sources as one of the greatest goals ever scored. Oh, okay. With the score 2-0 to Reading, the goalkeeper, Steve Death, threw the ball to the right back, Gary Peters, who spotted Friday standing near the left-hand corner of the opposing penalty area. Peters passed high and diagonally across the pitch towards it forward, who jumped into the air and used his chest to cushion the ball and knock it into the air with his back to the goal, about 25 to 30 yards away from the net. As Friday landed, he ferociously ferociously powered the ball towards the goal, kicking over his shoulder and turning after the ball had gone. The shots flew straight into the top right-hand corner of the net, stunning the crowd, players and Thomas the referee, who put his hands over his head in disbelief. Jesus. An over-the-shoulder goal. That's, that's, that, that is, yeah, that I don't know much about football, but I know that that's pretty amazing. Yeah, that, yeah, okay. I'm totally gonna YouTube after we're done. Just, just if I, if I can see it somewhere. I didn't think to look at. Hopefully, it does exist on YouTube. Yeah, or if not, I can at least see an over-the-shoulder goal and at least kind of put it into my brain and be like, "Oh shit, you did that." I'll never forget it. Thomas recalled. It was the sheer ferocity of the shot on the volley, over his shoulder. If it hadn't gone into the top corner of the net, it would have broken the goalpost. Even up against the likes of Pele, that rates as the best goal I have ever seen. Reading went on to win the game 5-0. When Thomas told Friday after the game that he'd never seen a better goal, Friday replied, Really? You should come down here more often, I do that every week. <laughs> Yep, alright. That, that, in my head, that's what the trailer closes with. For the film that'll be made. is like the Tom Hardy, Jack O'Connell, Taron Egerton kind of walking. And just talking to the ref going, bloody hard. He says, do that, I do that every week. Boom. Credits. Reading moved to within one point of promotion on the 19th of April 1976 with a 1-0 home victory over Brentford. Friday set up the game's only goal, beating three players before hitting the post with his shot. Ray Hiran scored from the rebound. Friday scored a powerful left foot volley during the first half of a 2-2 draw away against Cambridge United two days later. The result secured third division football for Reading. At the celebrity dinner after the game, the Reading captain, Gordon Cumming, saw some fluted wine glasses and voiced admiration. I wouldn't mind a few of them for a home, he said. Give me a few minutes and I'll get them for you, Friday replied. Going around the dining room and picking them off tables, he stole a whole box full of the glasses, which he managed to sneak out of the hotel and onto the team coach. Much to Cummings' annoyance, he then decided to keep them for himself. (laughs) Oh, okay. Like, like, full disclosure, I've definitely (laughs) been in a situation where, like, a nice pub glass has gone missing. I think most people have. I've done I the think, same. Uh, <laughs> but a box full. <laughs> I mean, it's the box full, but it's also the fact he's then looked at me and he's gone, nah, 
Gud, han är bara, nej, det är mine. Så sa jag, fair, okej, all right, you get it. You, you do what you're gonna do, fair enough, all right. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. With 22 goals for the year, 21 in the league, Friday was once more Reading's top goalscorer, and for the second consecutive season, the team's player of the year. After Reading were promoted, Waller met with the players on the 4th of June 1976 to discuss their contracts for the 67 for the 76 to 77 season. The wages offered to the Reading players were far lower than they had been expecting, causing the team's morale to fall drastically. We got screwed by the club, midfielder Eamon Dumfrey later claimed. We didn't get what we'd been promised. Friday was so offended by the low salary offered that he handed in a transfer request, telling the Evening Post that the club's directors clearly did not share his ambition. They would be happy to stroll along in the bottom half of the third division forever, he said. The row over the new contracts continued throughout the off-season, while Friday planned his second wedding, as he had been formally divorced from Maxine <clears throat> after years of separation, and subsequently become engaged to Liza Diemel. Liza Damel. I'm not sure how you pronounce her surname. Damel? Damel? Uh. D-E-I-M-E-L. Yeah. Damel? Damel? Eliza. Liza. Yeah. Yeah. After the pay dispute was settled on the 5th of August, the couple were married in Reading three days later. The wedding was filmed by Southern Television, before whose cameras Friday, wearing an open-necked tiger skin pattern shirt, brown velvet suit and snake skin boots, sat on the steps of the church and rolled a joint. Oh my god. Oh my god. Friday had invited about 200 people, mostly friends and relatives from London, who joined in the drinking, drug taking, and ended up fighting each other and stealing the couple's wedding presents, one of which was a large quantity of cannabis. Oh my god. Liza later called the wedding the most hilarious thing ever. Rob Lewington said, I've been to a few weddings, but never one like that. No shit! <laughs> no shit! But you know, I've never been to a wedding like that before. Really? A wedding where the guests, you know, they got drunk, they took drugs, they knocked seven shades of shite out of each other, and then they nicked wedding presents, including, like, I'm just imagining just like a Big old like like an IKEA bag full of yeah. cannabis. <laughs> it's and they were it's just gonna like, be a big bag. <laughs> oh, I was thinking I was like, oh, a large quantity of cannabis. I'm like, the reason I was there first thing came to mind, partly because I think, oh, I need to go to IKEA, <laughs> <laughs> which is like just like those big, the big blue handle, just like <laughs> and just, just chock, chock full of chock full of weed, full of cannabis, <laughs> full of the wacky bag. And I was there, it's like. And that was filmed. <laughs> the TV, so there's, you know, some poor cameraman's being like, "Yes, well, now you know, cartoons followed followed by, you know, a Premiership footballer getting absolutely off his face on TV." <laughs> but it is the seventies, so hey, diddle diddle. Oh my god, he can't, he can't be real. He can't. <laughs> be. I keep doing this. It's basically just being like, it's all like some massive joke or like a prank. And I'm like, no, he, no, he, he's, he's real. He's just got what? Well, like, I'm not even a film at this stage. Like a mini series needs to be. <laughs> like covering a year for each thing. It's just like, cool. Here's the time he stole a swan. Here's the time he stole some statues. Here's the time his second wedding, and he was where, like, dr- like dressed like a seventies porn director. From <laughs> yes. <laughs> And had a wedding where apparently, it, you know, people were battering the hell out of each other to get hold of, you know, a giant thing of cannabis. I, I yeah, yeah, okay. This is either going to be the worst thing or best thing about this for you. We're only just over halfway. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I mean, in a way, it's a relief, but I'm like, oh, my God, how much more can there be? <laughs> He's still only mid twenties as well. Oh god! <laughs> Can he not just decide to like? Oh, I'm gonna be. I'm. I'm gonna 
give it all up and become like, you know, a sales assistant or, you know, a <laughs> priest or something. Mind you, if you're the priest, you just mix the silver or something and run them away. <sighs> oh, so you have yeah. heard of him. <laughs> I've got, I, just, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if he's like he left his wife, married another football player, and now they live as like you know goat herders or something. <laughs> With goats who he insists are referred to as his children and gives them all authentic Greek names, you know. I I would be at this stage. At this stage, I wouldn't be surprised. There comes a point where they're just like, yeah, yeah. Really, so he did that. Yeah, I, I, I have to believe it now. It's not even once. It's just <laughs> I have to believe it. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Let's go. Hurley later reflected, "He lost his way when we got promotion. He really must have celebrated all through the summer." Friday reported back for pre-season training in bad condition, and although Hurley claimed that Friday was trying hard to regain his fitness. The forward was having trouble with his asthma, and lost some of his pace, and was obviously unfit. Although his performances during August quickly improved, they were still not up to his previous standard, and the Evening Post revealed on the 30th that Reading were preparing to sell him to a first division club. After scoring in two successive Reading home wins on the 4th and 7th of September, against Warsaw and Wrexham respectively, Friday took part in a third consecutive victory on the 13th, away against Northampton Town. After this, he missed two matches, according to the Post because he was suffering from flu. When he returned when he returned to the team, he was far from his best. Suddenly, he had lost a yard, and his control of the ball was not as good, Hurley recalled. Hurley was by now aware that his forward was using drugs, and attempted to keep his player's habit a secret, while he patiently worked to bring him back around. However, Friday began to regularly miss training, and Hurley's su- subtlety was misinterpreted as inaction by other Reading players, who had become unsettled and complained about Friday's conduct. The club became increasingly minded to sell him, but although top flight clubs, Queen's Park Rangers and West Ham United were interested, they were reluctant to buy Friday because of his temperament. One quote said they weren't sure they could handle him. By the end of October 1976, Hurley had given up attempting to rehabilitate his player, believing that the only solution was to sell him to a bigger team. The squad needs you, but I owe it to the club because I can't have you using drugs, he told Friday. If I know you're using drugs, it won't take the major clubs long to find out. You've got to get your act together. Friday was made available for transfer on the 28th of October. He was watched by other clubs throughout November and December in 1976, but although he performed well in some games, including a 1-1 draw against Crystal Palace, in which he scored the team's only goal, he was poor in others. After being marked out of the game during the Reading's 4-0 loss away against Mansfield Town on the 8th of November, he was substituted. Coincidence or not, wrote the Evening Post, when Friday left, so did half a dozen managers and scouts. Friday was so angry at his team's performance that he broke into Mansfield dressing room and defecated in the team bath. Oh, oh, come on. <sighs> Why didn't you steal so you didn't have to fucking shit in the bath? Oh, can you imagine? Oh, <laughs> oh. Oh, it would have been like a bomb went off. Oh. <laughs> you know he would have been like neat about it. It would have been like, you know. It, it, like, it, would, it would have been like a Jackson Pollock gone wrong. It would have been like, oh. <sighs> Come on, Friday. Come on. <sighs> Reading's asking price stood at £50,000, and the first transfer offer came from second division side Cardiff City at around mid December. Cardiff's boss, Jimmy Andrews, bid 28000 half of his offer a year before, which Reading's directors eagerly accepted, wanting the troublesome player off their hands as quickly as possible. Friday, however, was reluctant to go to the Welsh club, saying that it was too far from home and that he wanted to go to a first division team and he wanted more money. However, when Hurley told him that unless he went to Cardiff, he wouldn't be released, he agreed and travelled to Wales on the 30th of December, 1976. 
On arrival at Cardiff Central Railway Station, Friday was arrested by the British Transport Police for having travelled from Reading with only a platform ticket. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Upon arrival at the train station, it's just like, welcome to Cardiff, you nicked. Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. <sighs> Andrews bailed his player out of police custody and took him to Ninian Park to sign the contract. Despite the manner of Friday's arrival, and although he knew that there had been something wrong with him, the Cardiff manager was still happy with his purchase, describing the £28,000 transfer as an absolute steal. After a long night of drinking the night before his Cardiff debut, Friday lined lined up against Fulham on the 1st of January 1977. The Fulham defence included former England captain Bobby Moore, but Friday marked his first match for the Welsh club with two goals. He also squeezed Moore's testicles during the game as Cardiff won 3-0. Andrews was so happy with Friday's performance that he phoned Hurley two days later on Monday morning. He said, Old Charlie, he was magnificent. He tore them inside out. Moore was chasing him all over the place. The Cardiff manager continued to heap praise on his new acquisition, until Hurley stopped him. Jimmy, you've only had him four days. Give it a few months, he warned. Friday's form declined after his strong debut, and his personal life remained troubled and chaotic. He vanished regularly and missed Cardiff matches. He was supposed to be living in Bristol, but his manager would often find on visiting his house that he'd been elsewhere for weeks. Leslie Hamilton, the Cardiff club doctor, later said that he believed at the time that Andrews was being far too soft on Friday. According to teammate Paul Went, the former would simply leave after each match, not to be heard of until he returned for the next game. Oh, oh, okay. Went said he wouldn't even bother to have a shower. He'd just get dressed, take his carrier bag with his dry martini, and he'd go (laughs) with no explanation. Wait, so he just sort of like gets dressed, picks up the carrier bag, and in my own, he accepts the dry martini with him and just goes, and then just walks off because like yep not lie that's almost classy that's <laughs> almost the carrier almost. bag takes it down from classy unfortunately the carrier bag takes it down not having a shower takes it down if it had been showered dressed takes his bag picks up Matty and says see you guys and walks off that's fairly cool but the carrier bag lets it down and the, <laughs> and the, fact, the fact he doesn't shower yeah so like okay alright because <laughs> like, what does he to hit the dry martini in? in my head it's at, like a proper martini glass but god knows it might just be like a pint or something <laughs> I put, like a pint of dry martini like at house parties we used to I honest to god had like a mug once and it was because I've had a couple of drinks already and I was um, I'd accidentally broken my toe and didn't know but that's a different story um, so I had someone's mug full of Martini Bianco, which I thought, oh my god, this tastes delicious, and I drank it, and just, I thought, god, this is lovely. And they went, you're supposed to put out a glass, and I was like, yeah, no. no. <laughs> everything's easier, what was it, everything's easier with a handle. Definitely. <laughs> which, which explains why I've developed two of my own. I'm like, everything's easier with a handle on each <laughs> Oh, oh. oh, that was a bit professional. <laughs> did, did you want me to cut that out? <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Can, Thought I'd check. Tell, they can, they can, they can, they can check and can see from my profile picture. They're not going to like him, but he's the he's the, he's the epitome of slim hell. I'm like, no, no. You could you could smuggle immigrants in with my hips, <laughs> and I'd be happy to do it. <laughs> oh. oh, it's fine. Can you tell that I'm tired? The bits of the Oh god, this whole thing's amazing. I I am honestly gonna. I know I said this with like Elizabeth Fry. I am gonna have to find a book about it. And in fact, what I might do is if I can get it, I, I might get Amazon Prime over for when I'm away. <laughs> when I'm away. Next week. People are like, you're not into small Chris. I'm like, I'm not. Oh, God, okay. Okay, right, yeah, yeah. While Hurley had been able to command Friday's respect, 
it soon became clear that Andrews wasn't able to control him and that the Londoner disliked his new manager. Soon after moving to Cardiff, Friday appeared one day in Hurley's office in Elm Park, asking to come back to Reading. Hurley said, he still called me boss. He said, I can't play for that little bastard. (coughs) Referring to Andrews. (laughs) You're the only one who seems to be able to get me right. Can I come back to you? Hurley said that while he would be happy to have Friday back on the team, the club could not afford to repay the 28000 transfer fee to Cardiff, so he would have to go back and continue playing there. Unhappy living so far from home, Friday began to travel back to London at weekends. He avoided paying for his rail fares by knocking on locked toilet doors and shouting, Tickets please, pretending to be the inspector. When the occupant passed his ticket under the door to be checked, Friday would simply pick it up and walk away to use it for himself. (laughs) I love that. That is, yeah, that is really clever. (laughs) Well, so I was just like, oh, tickets. Right, okay, here you go. Thank you. And then just walks off with it. (laughs) And they can't prove it because it's just like, yeah, no, I bought this. Oh my god. Oh, gosh. Right. Don't do this, kids. I don't think you can get away with it now because the way the, the toilets on most trains work. That's quite funny. Yeah. That's, that's... Ooh. I'm annoyed. That's really... <laughs> really small. I'm annoyed. Okay. Un- unfortunately, it couldn't work now because of the way trains are, but if you're on a train that has an old-style door, give it a go. <laughs> yeah. I think the worst thing that'll happen is, well, you might get arrested, but, you know, <laughs> ne- you know, follow the example of Robin Friday and never let the, the risk of being arrested. I'm, I'm going to be honest, get, the get statement, the follow the example of Robin Friday, is a really dangerous statement. <laughs> I don't know, I, see, I literally can't see it straight. <laughs> Mind you, none of my faces are straight, so, um, that's a, that's... That's a little joke there for those. <laughs> and then, no, lost. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, ready, yeah. Paul Went also recalled an incident during training when he had thrown a ball out from goal and accidentally hit Friday on the back of the head. Another player standing near the forward started laughing. Friday concluded that this man had thrown the ball. In response, he viciously punched the laughing player in the jaw, striking him with such force that he had to wear a neck, spra- a neck brace for two weeks. Fuck you <laughs> he hit, Wait, he hit him that hard? <laughs> yes! <laughs> you, wear neck brace for two, like you wear a neck brace if you've been in like a car accident. <laughs> no, with him. I'm like, he, geez, it's like he, look, he didn't shatter his jaw. It sounds like, oh my god. He wasn't human. He wasn't human. (laughs) Late in Friday's first season in Wales, Cardiff took on Luton Town on the 16th of April 1977. Cardiff were in the relegation zone and had not won in seven games, while Luton were fifth in the table and challenging for promotion. After clashing repeatedly early in the match with Luton goalkeeper... Oh, God. This is not an easy name. Milia Alexic. I believe. Friday was lectured by the referee for a high tackle on the goalkeeper in the 36th minute. Friday held out a hand to apologise, but Alexic reacted angrily. When the free kick was taken, Friday ran back, stole the ball from the Luton defender, broke away, rounded Alexic and slotted the ball past him into the net. In celebration, Friday jogged back past the goalkeeper whilst giving him the (laughs) V-sign. Cardiff okay. went on. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Go. I'm just, yeah. Cardiff went on to win the match four two, and at the end of the season avoided relegation to the third tier only on goal difference. Meanwhile, without Friday, Reading were relegated back to the fourth division by one point. Friday's actions became even stranger during his time at Cardiff. After they lost the second leg of the Welsh Cup final 3-0 to Shrewsbury Town on the 18th of May, the players and staff were awoken in the middle of the night by loud bangs coming from below their rooms. The cause was found to be Friday, 
standing on the hotel's snooker table in his underpants, throwing balls around the room in anger. <laughs> Okay. I know I need a deep breath. <laughs> okay. I'm trying not to cry with laughter. Okay. Okay. After failing to turn up for pre season training with Cardiff before the 77 to 78 season, Friday was reported to be in a London hospital suffering from an unknown virus, which had caused him to lose two stone in weight. He had suddenly appeared in Cardiff for training in October, two months into the season. He claimed to have been suffering from hepatitis, but medical tests disproved this. Andrews told the local press on arrival Friday had looked like the fittest player in the world, and hoped to avoid further disappearances persuaded a reluctant Friday to move from Bristol to Cardiff. The Londoner returned to the team for the away match at Brighton and Hove Albion on the 29th of October 1977, in which Cardiff once again in the relegation zone in the 20th place on goal difference. Friday was marked during the game by Mark Lawrence, who so frustrated the Cardiff forward with his close attention that Friday waited for Lawrence to attempt a slide tackle, then kicked him in the face. (coughs) After receiving a red card, Friday left the ground with the game still going on. But, according to some reports, before leaving... He broke into the Brighton dressing room and defecated in Lawrence's kit bag. Oh. <laughs> what a weird thing about defecating in the <laughs> Yeah. That poor guy, though, he gets kicked in the face by what seems to be like a Terminator and then yeah. he finds shit in his bag. I was like, nothing happened. It was just all close attention to his, like, right. I'm going to kick you in the face, and then when I get sent off, I'm going to shit in your bag. <laughs> Why? Because Why? he's mad. Oh, okay, alright. <laughs> <sighs> Andrews told the South Wales Echo on the 1st November, I'm sick and tired of it. To be sent off in his first game back is as much as a man can stand. Friday was transfer listed and served a free match suspension before making his final appearance on the 10th of September in Cardiff's 6-3 away defeat against Bolton. Liza was by now the mother of Friday's second daughter, Arabella, but around this time began divorce proceedings. Friday claimed that he had enough of people telling him what to do, and walked into Andrew's office on the 20th of December 1977 to announce that he was retiring from professional football the club promptly released him and cancelled his contract. Mm -hmm. After retiring, Friday moved back to London and returned to work as an asphalter and decorator. Shortly after Friday left Cardiff, Reading manager Maurice Evans was presented with a petition signed by 3,000 supporters requesting that he attempt to re-sign Friday. Evans contacted him and told him, if you would just settle down for three or four years, you could play for England. Friday replied with the question, How old are you? And after Evans answered, continued, I'm half your age and I've lived twice your life. Evans responded, you're probably right. Friday trained with Brentford during the 78-79 pre-season, but after regaining his fitness, suddenly changed his mind and stopped coming to training. He married for a third time in 1980, but was divorced again within three years. After a short time living back with his parents in Acton, Friday's family secured him a housing association flat in the area. He served a prison sentence during the 1980s for impersonating a police officer and confiscating people's drugs. (sighs) Oh my god. Again, not condoning, but genius plan. I know. So he just... Okay. So he used to, like, go around and just, like, you nicked. Give me me his stuff. And he just used it. Oh, that's... Cool. I'll arrest you unless you give me your drugs and promise not to do it again. So, of course, they yeah. hand the drugs over and then he just went and took them. Yeah. It's, it's kind wow. of brilliant. Yeah. Robin Friday was found dead in his Acton flat on the 22nd of December 1990 at the age of 38, having suffered a fatal heart attack. 
A biographer claimed that the incident was the result of a suspected heroin overdose. Oh no. Liza said, At the funeral, I've never seen so many people. When we got to the flat, the stairs and corridor leading to his mum's front door were packed with people. Friday is often cited as an unsung talent. A laterally applied nickname of The Greatest Footballer You Never Saw was used as a title of his 1997 biography. Both as a player and a personality, Friday remains a major figure for both his professional clubs. BBC Radio Berkshire sports editor Tim Deller, speaking in 2010, emphasised the importance of Friday's charisma to his contemporary and respective appeal, a point which was also highlighted by his second wife, who likened his personal charm to that of the Pied Piper. In terms of significance, Reading FC Della stated that Friday was the team's very own George Best. Cardiff-based band Super Furry Animals used a photo of him giving the V sign to Alexic in 1977 for the artwork of their 1996 single The Man Don't Give a Fuck, which was dedicated to his memory and his stand against The Man. That's, that's a pretty good tribute. I mean, yeah. Because we've, we've gone it through it. describes whole life, him. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's like, I mean, we've gone through his whole life, and it's just. It's, it's, if it was emphasised by anything, it was a guy who kind of wanted to do his own thing and, you know, went and did it. So, power to him. After winning the title of Player of the Millennium from Reading in 1999, he was voted the top all time cult hero for both Reading and Cardiff in a 2004 BBC poll, with, sim- with similar polls taking place at each Premier League and Football League club. He was the only player to appear in the top th- in the top three for two different sides. In 2007, a poll of fans run by Reading resulted in him once again being named the club's best ever player. Later that year, when Professional Footballers Association canvassed Reading supporters for their all-time favourite, he won again. Friday was ranked first in Channel 4's list of football bad boys in 2007, while Football 365 placed him 8th place in 2010's list of wasted talents. Friday's style of play was based around his exceptional ball skills, described by Cardiff doctor Leslie Hamilton as absolutely fabulous, and his instinctive football vision, which enabled him to both execute flamboyant individual moves and to create attacks for his teammates. Jimmy Andrews, his manager at Cardiff, later called Friday the complete centre-forward, and placed him on par with Alan Shearer, while Maurice Evans claimed that he could have played for England and was at least on level with international strikers he had worked with, such as John Aldrich and Dean Saunders. This opinion was shared by Hamilton and Friday's Reading teammate John Murray, both of whom declared in separate interviews that Friday would have been good enough to play for the England team if he had sorted his head out. A natural goal-scoring forward, Friday was also, was also unselfish, and would take just as much pleasure out of setting up a goal scored by a teammate as getting one himself. He possessed fine ball control and dribbling skills, and could also shoot with both great power and accuracy. The strong physical aspect of his game and exceptional competitive, combative spirit combined with all of this to create a a formidable forward player. Such was his ability in his arrival transferring Reading into one of the division's best sides in a matter of weeks. In 2010, Roger Titford stressed Friday's immediate and profound impact on the Reading team as a key factor in his lasting popularity. It was like comic book stories that kids from Robin Area would have read, he wrote. He was a ready-made star. On top of his technical talent, Friday was physically very strong and able to withstand sustained blows or injuries. According to Hamilton, he was uncommonly fit despite his lifestyle. He boasted an exceptional work rate, which Dreyer recalled gave any side, including him, a strong boot. When he was in the lineup, you'd have a centre forward and a centre half. Not only would he be up there running them ragged, but when it broke down, he'd be the first person to start tackling back. He was assisted in his smooth and effective sliding tackle, which despite all of Friday's attack skills, Hurley considered one of the strongest parts of his game. Reading historian Dave Downs described Friday's style of play as really quite bizarre. It was more or less Robin standing in the middle and saying, give me the ball and I'll see what I can do with it. 
On receiving the ball, he would then turn and either take on the opposing side single-handed or run with it to the wing to cross for a teammate. He didn't need anyone's help up front. They couldn't get the ball off him. He was one of those guys who could beat five players easily. Once he'd get the ball, it was impossible to get it off him. Friday was known for giving all in his all in any game he played, no matter the circumstances. Hurley later said that Friday would often become furious at his teammates for not trying their best, even in training. His strong drive to always win even extended to his use of physical intimidation to unsettle opposing players, leading contemporary critics to label him a villain. Friday also employed the use of psychological tactics aimed to spook opposing players. Friday would kiss them or fondle their testicles. Oh, oh. Cardiff teammate Paul Went recalled that those tricks would completely throw the defenders and affect their concentration. No shit! (laughs) Although he was often criticised for the number of bookings and send-offs he received, Friday believed that he was justified to chase victory by any means. Explaining his attitude in a 1977 interview, he said, On the pitch, I hate all opponents. I don't give a damn about anyone. People think I'm mad and a lunatic, but I'm a winner. (sighs) And that's the story of Robin Friday, one of the greatest footballers you probably never heard of. Yeah? I I mean, from my perspective, I don't really know much about football anyway, but I... I would say it's... (sighs) From what I've read, a lot of football historians agree that if he had been more in control in his personal life, he'd have been one of the greatest players of all time. That's a shame, really. Yeah. That there was something in his, you know, neurochemistry or kind of personality that just sort of, you know, did make him kind of both destructive and self-destructive and kind of self defeating a bit, which, yeah... It's a shame. I mean, I had no idea who this person was when you first said Robin Friday. I, I thought, oh, an actor. I thought, oh, okay, they're like a, you know, that's from whatever. But I just, no, I've never heard of him. Um, and it's a shame, really, because from the sound of it, you know, incredible talent, incredible focus, all that mm-hmm. sort of thing. And then, unfortunately, you know, and it is something that weirdly is mirrored in a lot of actors, which is there's so much potential and promise. And yet, with the introduction of kind of like drink and drugs and you know, kind of, they get a taste of the lifestyle and everything, and it all sort of slides away from them, and unfortunately some of them do end up, um, do end up exiting early to, you know, nick someone else's parlance. So, it's a shame, on the other, you know, on the other hand of it, you know, we did get, and it's, there's no point to that, we did get some very funny stories. We did get some really yes. funny anecdotes. You know, I will... I hold my hand up and say there was a couple of points when I was full on trying not to cry with laughter at this kind of <laughs> stuff, and it's 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 very bittersweet. It's very bit you know in the sense of looking back on it now, I'm sure at the time people were like this guy is a bit of a knobhead or he's a bit of a you know it, the kind of thing you probably say oh he's a real character, he's a real character that sort of thing. Um, but we don't know what was going on in his head. Um, yeah. So it's a yeah, it's a shame, really, because, and it, I mean, it's not, a, from the sounds of it, he didn't really want what you would, at least it's still in the sense, it's called a traditional life in the sense of, right, he has a boat, you know, a regular nine-to-five job, you know, marries, has kids, all that sort of thing, because he did marry and have kids, but there was no kind of, you know, faithfulness, not in regards to the first wife anyway, or kind of, who knows, with the second or third, but, yeah. No, it's 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 a story I'm, I'm glad I know, and I'll definitely be talking about it in the office because they know <laughs> I was going on to do. I was said, oh yeah, no, eccentric earth is this podcast where it's all unusual stuff, but I have no idea what it's going to be about before I start. So yeah, they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna last me around and be like, okay, here's one for the for the football fans of the group who's <laughs> ever heard of Robin Friday, and I'm predicting at least two people will go. I have no idea who that is, and I'm like, cool. Well, let me, and I'll I'll bring up either if it's like the Wikipedia article or if it's like, you know, like an arc, a regular article or something like that. I'll bring it up and just be like, <laughs> you know, and yeah, I, I, yeah. I'm just gonna, I'm, I'm 
transmission. It's also been quite a long one, so I just was like, yes. every all the thing I was like, oh my god, where's this? Where's, where's this story going? <laughs> this this has been the longest episode we've done, but I didn't want to cut any of it out because the football stuff. I myself didn't quite understand everything but it kind of it builds up to show how good a player he was so i didn't want to cut that out and then the anecdotes were so great i didn't want to lose any of them so it's no it's, yeah yeah all of a sudden i'm not i'm not complaining or anything but it was just it was like there was a part where i was just like oh my god how much can you fit in one life <laughs> and then unfortunately the poor guy died at 38 it's just it's you know yeah. <sighs> It's, oh, it's like well. he said to that manager, he's led a longer life than people yeah. twice his age. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm half as young as you, but I've lived twice your life. It's like, yeah, fair. And then that yeah. last quote you left with, which was like, people think I'm mad, I'm a lunatic, I'm a winner. And I'm like, well, in a way you are. You know, in a way, you know. And, and, and in a way he is, and it's one of those, you know, again... Going back to the first episode I did, which was Elizabeth Fry, it's a story that doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, having done a bit of research as we've been talking, I was like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna see. Once I found out that he passed away and everything, I thought, oh, okay, it's safe to kind of have a little look around because I didn't want to get spoiled. <laughs> um, with it. Well, I didn't. I was like, I don't want to get spoiled by it. Um, but I had a look and I was like, oh, so there are there are rumours they're going to be making a film about him. Which oh, I think would awesome. be interesting. Well, it's because it was like, oh, hey, and it, the, it was Robin Friday film came up as one of the Google options. So I was like, oh, okay. And it's one of these where it's like, oh, it's been in development for a while. So, I mean, I don't know how they're going to condense an entire life down that quickly unless it's just like a series of almost like vignettes and it just kind of, you know, it was either that or do a mini series or something like that. But yeah, I would be, knowing now what I know, I'd be more interested in seeing it um and mm. i kind of encourage people you know if you think you're not into football or anything i definitely check it out i went to football amy you said you're not a big football fan but the actual story is um kind of very interesting and it's well worth a read or well worth a little research yeah yeah it's what i think if you're not into football you don't need to be to be impressed by this person and shocked by his life it's it's a story you should definitely check out <laughs> yeah absolutely absolutely okay so if people enjoyed this episode and listening to the two of us where can they find you online and with your own podcasts yes um yeah so if you oh god i if you liked hearing from me that's weird um that's slightly odd but uh, yeah, if you you can find me on Twitter at higher underscore boy. I have a couple of active um, podcast projects going on at the moment. Uh, first of which is uh, Good Evening Podcast, or Good Evening and Alfred Hitchcock Podcast, which is me and two of my Canadian brothers. It is um, Brandon Shea Tala and Tom Caldwell. We are covering Hitchcock um, kind of chronologically, and we've just entered kind of uh, the early 1930s, back into the kind of the talk, he's not something which we're very happy about, um, and it's a good way of looking at it critically through different perspectives and kind of evaluating it, not just from um, like a, like an actual movie standpoint, but also from like a societal, critical um, lens and everything. And it's a lot of fun. Uh, the other project I have going on is North by Nerd West, which is me and one of my best mates, Emma Platt. Um, we're not on a regular thing. Uh, but it is a lot of fun and it's, they're usually at least an hour long and it's me and Emma chatting about anything we can think of. We have just released an episode uh, this week um, that is now available on iTunes so feel free to you know, rate, review and subscribe there. It's basically two best mates just nerding out um, and chat. Oh no, if you listen to it, it's basically it was just chatting absolute shit for like <laughs> 70 minutes but I, I liked it because because we kind of get each other. It's just like, oh yeah, no, just just listen, you know, have fun. Um, but yeah, those are my two main things. And then I pop in on you know excellent podcasts such as Eccentric Earth and Smorgasbord and uh, Three Wise Men and all that sort of thing. So if you follow any of them, 
I will probably be popping in at some point over the next uh, few weeks or months, depending on how my work and my uni schedule is going. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can find our social media by going to Twitter at eccentric underscore earth, or you can go to Facebook, which is facebook.com forward slash eccentric earth. And as I was so kindly promoted at the beginning of this episode, we've got a pretty cool Instagram, apparently. <laughs> so go find us there as well. And Honestly, the, the Instagram is good because it seems to always be on when I open my feed. <laughs> and it's just like, did you know that Pocahontas? And I'm like, no, I didn't. <laughs> and it's like, do you know, I've, I've genuinely used it at work before. There have been like trading cool facts and I just sort of cheekily flick it open. <laughs> And even if it's something they've never heard of, usually it sparks off another conversation. So I'm like, Haha. <laughs> this is how it works. Uh, but yeah, the Instagram's uh, really good as well. And I think, I'm not right, I think a lot of the Instagram stuff crosses over onto Twitter anyway. Yes, I, I try so if you don't use, yeah. sort of put the same things up on both, but sometimes they do differ. So a little tease to be All like, you've got to check out both, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, well, even that, or it kind of says, if you don't, you know, I'm like, I've got tons of friends who don't use Instagram, you know, um, check out Twitter. If you don't use Twitter, but you do have Instagram, there's no, there's no reason not to follow, basically, you know, Facebook, yeah. all that sort of thing. <laughs> we are also on all major podcast providers, and I did find out this week that for some reason, because of a little certain box that was ticked a certain way some of the so um podcast providers were only showing the last 10 episodes we have oh. now fixed that um all of our providers are up to date with all of our episodes so please go and find us on whichever one you use click subscribe so you don't miss an episode and if you enjoy this go back and check out some of the other ones because we've done some fun topics some really inspiring people and some some dark stuff as well so i'm sure there's something in there that will mm -hmm. interest you and you can find us on youtube as well so you can always subscribe to us there too yeah speaking from my perspective this is my fourth one um and it's quite fun because i've had to because it's kind of gone from inspiring weird dark funny so, <laughs> you've had a little bit of everything <laughs> i really have it's 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 hit the four major podcasts for like <laughs> food networks but like is it a bit dark yeah is it a bit funny is it a bit you know kind of inspiring and all that sort of thing yeah of course it is so yeah yeah and if anyone has any suggestions for topics they'd like to see us cover because we're always open for learning really fun weird history our email address is eccentric earth at outlook.com so send us anything you like there even if it's feedback or thanks anger hatred towards us whatever we want to hear what people think so that is about everything from us it's been an absolute pleasure as always talking to you chris and i've had Aww. a lot of fun introducing this topic to you thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay so, Thank you, everyone, for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye. Right. Bye. Headspace, blue mask, temple bell